Our guest is a four times tech founder, an investor in over 150 startups, and the founder and managing partner of a world renowned venture fund. And oh boy, does he love answering startups' burning questions about raising capital. Get ready to up your fundraising game, founders. Today, stay tuned to the Startup Life Live Show. Let's glow, everyone. Hello and welcome everyone to the Startup Life Live Show. I'm your host, Andy Lyons, four times founder and startup champion to founders around the world. And after raising four businesses of my own, I have a pretty clear idea of what you all are going through every single day, navigating all that uncertainty and opportunity. And that's why I'm so grateful that you carved out time to tune into the Startup Life Live Show because this is an opportunity to up your founder game. And as you up your founder game, oh yes, that's right. The more you know, the better your business will do, right? A big hearty welcome to the live viewers, to you replay viewers and podcast listeners. I'm so grateful to have you here tuning in and getting all the gems from this delicious conversation today. If you're tuning in on YouTube, please be sure to subscribe. And anyone watching via video, please click the like button on that video. It helps us get out to more folks. And to receive an alert whenever we post a new show on the Startup Life Live show, please join our meetup group, Startup Life Live Meetup Group. Um, founders, I have a little bit of Andylicious advice for you today. It's really a seed thought for you to think about. And this is the fact. Just because you're struggling does not mean you're failing, okay? Opportunity always comes with opposition. And so you're going to have these hard times that feel like you're failing, but you are not. So hang in there. Keep moving forward. And remember, you're an amazing problem solver, You've got this, okay? I'm just going to dive right in to introduce our guest because I know we want to get every piece of deliciousness out of him today. It's the one and only Alex Iskold. He's a four times founder, software engineer, investor in over 150 startups, and the founder and a managing partner at 2048 Ventures. He currently serves as a coach and a VC in residence at the Harvard Business School. Are you ready to learn from one of the best VCs out there? I'm so excited to have in the show, Alex Iskold. The crowd goes wild. I got to get out the clappers. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much, Andy, for having me. Well, you know, folks, I have to tell you how I found Alex. And it's these incredible questions that he has on his startup hack. We're going to put the links are in the show notes. They're going to be, Ruth will be doing them live today in the comments. But it's his 30 questions investors ask during fundraising. Oh my gosh, so valuable. And what we're going to talk about a lot today, 11 questions founders need to ask investors during the first meeting. I mean, yeah, when you bring on somebody to your cap table, they have to be aligned and you have your agenda as well and you have value that you're adding. So Alex, thank you for being willing to come on the show. I've just been following you like crazy for years and I'm so delighted to have you. My pleasure, my pleasure. And I look, I look forward to it. Well, I'm always curious, you know, before we dive into all your fundraising brilliance and wisdom, I'd love to lo know a little bit more about your lived experience. I mean, especially what called to you and compelled you to become an entrepreneur? I mean, did you have folks in your life as examples or were you always hustling to make a, a dime while you were a kid? How did you become a founder? I, I I really became a founder by accident. You know, I grew up in Ukraine and uh, was not a ton of entrepreneurship during Soviet era. So um, I became a founder because I was obsessed with um, an area of science called complex systems. And basically it was my obsession with everything being a network that led me to start my first company and, uh, you know, really kind of tried to help people find bugs in their code. Uh, but it was an accident, you know, I wasn't planning on it. And 
uh, something compelled me. I was actually studying, uh, planning to get my PhD, uh, you know, at university, and I got 21 out of 22 points on the homework. And I basically said, what the hell, why is this 21 points? And the professor said, you didn't write it the way that I wanted you to write. And I was like, you know what? I'm not paying for five years of this. I'm out of here. And I dropped out after my master's and started my first company. See, I love that something fierce, right? You know, that just shows like, you're not going to tell me how I need to be in the world. I already know about that. Oh, that's fierce. And that's a very typical founder. I mean, I've been unemployable, Alex, since 1992. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I mean, I, I did get picked up one place, but I fired myself. And the next time I tried to work for someone, they fired me. And I just said, why bother? Right. <laughs> um, but I found, can you just, before we go a little bit further, for folks who don't know what complex systems is, what is that? I, I wish more people uh, knew about this. It's It truly is, I think, a, a superpower. It's, it's a... Uh, it's basically a science that looks at everything in the world, whether it's economics or biology, from the perspective of networks. And so we live in the world of networks. I mean, you and I yeah. got connected through the professional network, but uh, many things from cells to economies to pretty much everything around us, galaxies, they form networks. And so when you have that perspective in the world, um, it's easier to live because you see more patterns and things make more sense. I'm feeling a matrix moment coming on, I'll just say. <laughs> it's all those dots that connect us in so many levels. And and folks, you know where I found Alex at my favorite bar, Twitter. Uh, you know, fingers are crossed. It, it all gets worked out eventually on, our, on that platform. But um, so, you know, you have launched four businesses and you had some nice exits with yours. Can you talk just a little bit about what you learned from either selling or, you know, how that whole process, take, share a little nugget so folks who are thinking about, you know, that exit someday down the road, that they have something in mind? Yeah, um, I got exceptionally lucky when I was 25. I, I, I sold my first company to IBM and, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's selling a business is a very difficult process. I've since helped many founders exit their venture. And, you know, it, you, you kind of give up something that you've made and um, it's difficult, but the cold and capitalistic answer is it's a transaction. Right. You give them the stock, they give you the cash. And so what happens to your product afterwards, who knows? And, I do think that it's difficult. It's difficult to sell it, but I, I do think that in the end, if you've put a lot of work into something and you get that monetary reward, that it truly feels wonderful. Absolutely. And I like to coach founders to always have a number in mind because you never know. Someone may come by and I've heard too many stories when someone got an offer, they say, oh no, we're going to do better than the next minute. You know, a few years later, they're selling for assets and liabilities. You know to understand that process. And, and did you have to stay on in some capacity? Because sometimes when a transaction happens, they ask the, the founding founders to stay on in some capacity. And other times they're like, see you, bye. Yeah. And I think, Andy, you're, you're spot on. I think I see the same exact thing where, um, you know, founders have an opportunity to sell and then they forego it and then they regret it later. It's, it's, it's really painful. Um, but, you know, in terms of my journey, I did stay at IBM for a few more years and shipped a whole bunch of new products based on the stuff that I've developed. So, uh, you know, had a wonderful time there. Isn't that great? As you look back at your own four businesses, because I know you have a whole bunch of stories from the ones you've invested in, but on your own, please share a few favorite mistakes, missteps, fails, because Alex, we have a lot of first time founders tuning in. And I know you founders out there, you're often thinking I'm the worst founder ever. I'm the only <laughs> one who ever has made this mistake ever. And I know Alex can share very clearly that no, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, um, I actually started two startups and then other efforts were, you know, one venture firm and, uh, and then, you know, a, a nonprofit my second startup straight up failed miserably so painful after six years 
uh, ultimately went to zero. Um, tons of amazing learning and so much fun. But ultimately, looking back, I think we didn't really even have the business model nailed. I truly did not operate it well at all. So in a way, a lot of the stuff that I've written was a reflection on what I did not do well. And, um, you know, from mis, you know, mishiring to not hiring senior team soon enough to uh, not recognizing that it would be difficult for us to compete with Twitter and other large companies. Um, many, many things that I think we miscalculated. We were exceptional at product, but that was not enough because great companies aren't just products. There are a lot more than that. So uh, for sure, I tell this to founders, I bet, uh, you know, a lot. They're a million times better founders than I ever was. I mean, I think I've cleaned up a little bit and I'm better at running the firm, which is also like a mini startup. But yeah, yeah everybody makes mistakes. Uh, and, you know, and they if inform you don't you. fail, you don't live. Yeah, right. 100%. And they inform you, everyone. See, that's the beauty of being able to reframe when disaster hits. And I have to say, I just love like love how you said we had a great time. We had a lot of fun. And but, you know, <laughs> we were very happy with what we were doing. It just wasn't viable or sustainable. And that happens a lot, too, for folks. But, Alex, there's you know, a point where um, you know, founders have to reframe when the you know what hits the fan and they have to go, okay, that disaster happened, but why? And how can I get better? Or what can I do better? And boy, some really amazing innovative moments can happen out of disasters. And you can also make better decisions as a result, right? When you're 100%. pushing the envelope like that. You gotta be, I think the biggest superpower is to be self-reflective. If you cannot analyze yourself, uh, you're not going to do well as a founder. I mean, I, I admire founders who are so gritty, they are resilient, they just keep pushing forward. But um, sometimes they just keep banging their head against the wall and stubbornness is good, but you need strategy, you need self-awareness. And if you don't have that, you're gonna run into trouble. Oh my gosh, everybody, that's a stitch that on a pillow moment, right? Be self-reflective and take that information that's happening or feedback you're getting and put it to work. I love that something fierce. Hey, Mia Voss, thanks for tuning in from Florida. You wonderful goddess, you. I'm just going to pop up because everybody knows when Mia enters the room, we have to put up her amazing podcast, Shit We Don't Talk About with Mia Voss. Nobody talks about the tough things like Mia Voss does. So, so happy you're tuning in today, Mia. I want to remind everybody, I popped up the banner a few times, but I said in the beginning, Alex loves to answer questions. And he, he told me that he already knows everything he's going to be saying, but come on, ask him some questions get some, you know, pick his brain. Okay. You know, a lot of times people are like, Oh, can I just pick your brain? And many of us say, as soon as you pay that invoice today, Alex is here. So you can get your questions answered and he loves it. So pop your questions in the comment section. So, um, as you went through these difficult four, you know, not difficult, but these growth periods during your four businesses, what was a favorite mindset hack other than being self-reflective, which I just love, but did you have another mindset hack that other founders could learn from that helped you stay focused and get out of bed every day? I would say I've always had incredible drive and just, just focus on competing with myself and getting better. I mean, it was always about hunger for learning and just bettering myself through knowledge. That's kind of what was my drive since day zero. And it continues to be like every improvement that I make is it's basically in the name of learning. I just love understanding the world uh, and learning. Uh, and I think building the framework um, but I think in recent years, especially since I've wrapped up my second startup, I've been a huge champion and advocate of self-care for founders and for humans in general. So I've written a lot on this topic, but um, it's sort of an obvious realization. But uh, just like when you're on the plane and they tell you put on your mask first, there is a reason for that. Yeah. Uh, you really can't truly 
be your best for your family, your children, your friends, and for your company, for your startup, if you don't give to yourself first. And I think it's taken me a long time to understand that simple thing. And I teach this to founders. Startup journeys are marathons and sprints all intertwined. They're absolutely crazy madness. We die in the process. The only way to survive is to have really strong self-care routine, whatever it is, uh, but give to yourself first before you jump into the madness of every day. Oh my gosh, I love that founder journey. Let's give Alex a round of applause, everyone. This is so important, founders. Really take in what Alex just said, okay? Because you, if your engine is empty or you're showing up exhausted, you're just not going to be bringing your best to what you're doing. And in order to get the outcomes that you're seeking, you have to take care of yourself. Hooray. I just got a quick hello to Brent Manuel. He's a loyal fan of the show, and he reminds everyone how important diversity is and how a lot of times those who are disabled, and remember folks, diversity includes those who are with visible as well as invisible disabilities, need a seat at the table because boy, what they have to innovate on every day in order to have a successful life and move forward, Brent is a perfect example of that as well. So thank you. I'm so sorry you've been under the weather since Tuesday, Brent. I hope you feel better. And one of my favorite founders and investors out there, No Fall, how are you? He says, hey, goddess, I feel being stubborn and adamant is important. Else you get walked over in this cutthroat startup world, especially by the investors. Well, they're putting it out there as always, No Fall. Thank you for that. And hi, Martha. She has a question for Alex. So happy that you're here. I want to reach a couple more benchmarks before officially starting to raise. So, you know, Okay, so that question, I'm not sure what that means, but a few benchmarks are important. And if you, and we'll have the links and Ruth will share the link as well with you. The 30, um, Alex's questions, uh, 30 questions founders, I'm um, sorry, did I get that? Yeah, ask, investors ask founders during fundraising. I got to tell you, these questions will prepare you more than anything for a benchmark. So I, Oh, here we go. Here comes the more, more questions. She says, I want to take four more months until I raise in order to reach certain benchmarks. I would like to already add relevant angel investors to our monthly newsletter. Should I reach out myself or follow the typical path and already try to get warm intros, set up phone calls? Yeah, Alex, there you go. I mean, I think, I think do, do both. You know, if you can get a warm intro, warm intros are always better. Uh, but, you know, we are so lucky to be in the in the in the world now in tech where uh, people are readily accessible. You know, you you can you can email people and and uh, I I mean I don't know um, whether you really want to invest time now to build relationships, especially for angel or or pre seed round. You can um, things move pretty quickly now, so I would say as soon as you're ready with those benchmarks and metrics and milestones. I think you can just fully focus on 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 the fundraise. Excellent. And you know, Marcy, make sure that you understand what those benchmarks are and if they're investor friendly benchmarks. Because oftentimes we might be a little off on what investors are looking for. And do not hesitate to join some accelerator or get some coaching for your business to help you with this process. Hey, Aunt Ethan Anthony, how you doing? How's your puppy doing? Oh my gosh, so good to see you. I don't know if you heard, but Alex is really into complex systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alex, I have to tell you, Ethan Anthony, when you see his uh, <laughs> his LinkedIn URL is just data geek or something like that. He's just the numbers that make, make his heart sing with joy. He's in New York City too. You guys should uh, get to know each other. Um, so moving right along, I just want to find a little few more questions I want to get from you on your lived experience, which is you... Uh, were Techstars New York City Managing Director. So I'm curious about this step and what lit you up about this opportunity and how did this experience serve your next role as a VC investor? Yeah, I mean, 
truly probably was the most transformative um, experience for me as a human being. So I, um, you know, after my second startup failed miserably, I got a call from Brad Feld and David Cohen, who- Oh, uh, wait a minute. I got a call a, from Brad Feld. You know, folks, not everybody gets a phone call from the founders well, of Techstars. Brad, I was lucky because Brad was a, an angel investor in my second startup. And uh, they they basically said, hey, do you want to run Techstars program in New York? And I literally, I think, made one angel investment before that or two. I didn't know much about investing. So I, I took the job without knowing what to expect. And then five years later, 105 startups, you know, invested in everything from diamond rings to de-icing of airplanes. I mean, of course, a lot more de-icing of the airplanes than diamond rings. But, um, you know, in life, when you think about it, you can learn through um, just a handful of ways. You can learn by reading books um, or you can learn through travel. But when you travel, you see diversity of the world and you meet a lot of people. But the fastest way to learn is just to meet incredible amount of amazing people very, very fast. And that's exactly what Techstars Opportunity was for me. It was, you know, full on MBA and then some, and was just an incredible, incredible sequence of mentors, founders, business models, everything. So was exceptionally lucky to have that experience. See, I love that. And, and I would say it was a self-care moment for you as well. Right. I mean, you're coming it, off. It of was, it was, it was, I actually gave up drinking completely before I took the job. So I was uh, a little overdoing it with my second startup because things weren't going well. And, and you know, I, I used to drink expensive Barolas and Brunellos and it was not good for me and it wasn't good for our family budget. But jokes aside, when I took on the Texter's job, I, I quit cold turkey. So I haven't had alcohol in 10 years. Uh, and uh, Congratulations. yeah, I highly recommend it because it's truly empowers you uh, to be better at self-care. Absolutely. And sobriety on every level, whatever your addiction is, is so important. And it's a daily commitment, but it's a commitment to something that is so important, which is you being fully present here in your true authentic self and taking care of yourselves for you and your loved ones in your life. I'm so happy you did that. So let's talk about 2048 Ventures. Why did you launch a venture fund? And why did you call it 2048? Right. Um, so, it, you know, after five years at Techstars, I, I was feeling the itch. Because like you, I'm pretty unemployable. And so <laughs> I wanted to have my own thing again. And uh, my wife made it clear that I shouldn't start another company. Um, and so I was like, well, you didn't say don't start a venture firm. So that's exactly what I did. But j jokes aside, um, this was pre-COVID. And our notion was that we wanted to create very technical um, institutional pre-seed firm that is truly, truly day zero uh, investor in uh startups in underinvested geos. So we weren't really focused on SF and New York. Uh, our mission was to basically invest across US and Canada. And, you know, we had very firm thesis around pre-seed uh, being an amazing opportunity for platform and infrastructure right. investments across different sectors. And so uh, that was the sort of the inception moment. Now, um, the bad news is I can't tell you the, why we named the firm 2048 because it's a secret. Okay. And so basically how it goes is, you know, like a good piece of, of art, everything is in the eye of the beholder. So okay. we want everyone to have their own interpretation of what it means to them. Well, I think something's going to happen in 2048 that's delicious. So... <laughs> Who knows what it could be, but I love that because I love intrigue and, uh, and I just love that you have, mm -hmm, it's 2848. Mm -hmm. So that's perfect. Was it hard to get money into your fund when you went out to LPs and institutional investors and what, how large was your first fund? 
uh, our first fund was 27 million and our second fund uh, is 65. Um, you know, this is another lesson and, and I'm known for saying chance favors prepared mind. So to raise the first fund, I spent six months preparing and then two and a half months raising. Um, and the second fund, we spent about three months preparing and again, two and a half months raising. Uh, I love to nerd out and prepare and whiteboard and think everything through. So from how to put together compelling deck that's authentically delivers what we're building to a financial model to then most importantly, thinking about who the makeup of our LPs should be and how do we reach them. And so we are exceptionally lucky to be backed by top of the top founders in the world. And that was our mission to basically empower technical founders who's already built great businesses to through us then invest in the next generation of great companies. And so that's what I share with founders. You know, you have to put a lot of thought and have a lot of discipline to prepare and rushing into fundraising, certainly venture fund, that's just silly. You cannot randomly raise a venture fund. But even with a pre-seed round or a seed round, a lot of preparedness and deliberation is what is what I recommend. Right. And when you first started investing, what was your typical check size and has that changed over the years? It has. We were writing like four to five hundred K checks when we started. Mm -hmm. And then uh now we write five hundred K to two million. So we are very, very focused on pre-seed, but we also are set up to lead uh, slightly larger seed rounds now. Excellent. So I have a question that came in through one of my emails um, from a tech and consumer product company, and they're about to go out for 10 million. And they're wondering, do they begin their raise? And they, they already have the great traction. And I mean, this is gonna take them from here to woo global, okay, expansion. And so do they begin focused on the lead investors? Or do they, because, you know, sometimes you get some investors will say, yeah, we can come in, but, you know, come back to us when you have your lead investors. Sometimes they want to come in and just let us know when you get the lead investor. What are your thoughts about that? Really complex question depends on the situation. But I'm going to guess that if they have a lot of traction, that maybe they previously raised capital. Oh, yeah, so they already have seed money. Yep. They've had seed money. So the first step is to go back to your seed investors and say, hey, we're about to go out and raise uh, Series A. Uh, are you guys going to take your pro rata? And that's a really important question to ask. The answer may be no, like, for example, in our fund one, we don't really have reserves, so I'm no longer able to take pro rata. And so that's just known and that's fine. But if people do commit to pro rata, then you know how much what is, is the pro, rata? pro rata. Pro rata simply means a maintaining percentage of ownership that okay. investor already has. So typically, uh, you know, investors do that uh, because they continue to believe in the company. And so effectively, the startup should confirm how much capital is committed into the round from so-called insiders, people who are already in. That's the first step. Then it really totally depends. If they feel very bullish on their numbers, then yes, they should go and... Um, you know, try to find a lead investor. That's typically what happens for Series A. Um, it isn't always the right strategy, and it's definitely not the right strategy for pre-seed or seed. Uh, a better strategy for smaller raises is always to do either progressive caps or soft commit people, um, you know, before really going out for that large check. But for Series A, Yes, typically you go after the lead. I know I, I'm kind of caveating it a lot because it truly, truly depends. Um, if you guys get over to my blog, startuphex.vc, you can find a blog post for each situation because it truly, it really varies. Yeah, we're going to, in fact, we're going to pull up the blog post right now. 
And folks, you can see Startup Hacks by Alex Iskold. We're going to go look at these um, 11 questions real quickly here because I really want founders to understand that so often we're very busy, Alex, getting prepared for the investors' questions, right? And what I love about these questions is they're, especially for the first time founder raising for the first time, they're questions they would never have thought to ask. And folks, for example, you know, are you interested in potentially investing in my company? And if so, what are the next steps? And you can see Alex provides some great insight to that question. And then two, what is your investment process and how long does it take? Three, what is your check size? I mean, these are so important, Alex. I love that you came up with this. And how many more investments are you planning to make this year? Okay, folks, to me, this is so important. And Alex, I just love, love, love that you came up with these questions because founders have to get the right investors in their funnel as well, right? And it's a tough balance when you're running on fumes practically and you want to get some money in desperately. But what you've done is these 11 questions, how did you come up with them? I, I've participated in, I think, over 250 fundraisers. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, everything from pre-seed to series d uh and i've been exceptionally lucky and so you know you learn by trial and error and so my style has always been when founders came back to me and asked me questions instead of answering a question to a specific founder i wrote a blog post and i wish i could claim that i invented that idea but it really comes from fred wilson who's been doing it for many many years mm -hmm. Whenever people ask him a question, he just writes a blog post. And so I, I've done the same thing. And so there's a lot of knowledge uh, that's on the blog that's really um, a live living reflection of what I know and what's happening kind of today and you that's know right. and, and, and the strategies and techniques for how to how to how to handle investors. One thing I wanted to mention that's super important. Um, well, two things. One, you should always prepare for investor meetings, always. And the thing that I see founders struggle with truly is time management during those meetings because investors, including myself, are always aggressive. We take over time and we start shooting questions. Founders get excited. They lose track of time. But it's so important to e either ask these questions in the beginning, you can't ask all 11, but ask important ones, but time managed so that you can have a proper wrap up. What are the next steps? Right. Uh, and all the critical questions that weren't answered. Well, what is a typical time allotment that you would give a, a startup founder? I do 30 minute meetings, mm -hmm. which I think is so much time for like an early first get to know you. So it does not feel rushed i mean if it's clear that this isn't a fit we continue to you know obviously have a conversation and then i let founders ask me whatever questions they have and uh if we're getting excited and truly digging in then time flies and you know i still i actually make sure that founders have a chance to ask us questions but not all investors do and it's really important in the end of every single meeting to understand where you stand with each investor. See, and I'm just going to add this back to this uh, stream again, folks. And this is one of my favorite questions, which is who are some of the founders you backed that I can talk to? I mean, Alex, come on. I mean, we founders need to do due diligence, right? But sometimes 100%. they are afraid. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you, uh, well I, th I think we as an industry moving uh, very quickly in the direction of like, listen, everything is two way street. Who is on your cap table truly matters. Money isn't all the same. It's completely false. I'm very saddened to see some founders. They're just like, first come, first serve, whoever pops in, I'll take their money. It's like, great, but you're probably not going to have an incredible outcome because you're not thoughtful enough about things like this. So in terms of due diligence, you absolutely have to due diligence the investor to make sure that they're that they're good and there is a fit 
it's it's not a small thing. I, I reject the notion that investment is like marriage. I think people make that analogy. I don't think that's what it is. I think it's more like it's a journey together. It's partnership, but it is important to really uh, understand who is on the other side. Absolutely. And and for, it's kind of like when people say they're, they're, they're com- their business is like a family. I'm like, uh, no. Yeah, I don't know about <laughs> that. That's just yeah, about no. a marriage. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, not it's a-, a little. Yeah, I think it's a little much. I mean, listen, you can be warm and have a lot of empathy. Uh, but I think it's a professional environment, you know, and, and uh, yeah. yeah. And so, folks, you can visit Startup Hacks by Alex Iskold. Well, you know, links are in the show notes. I just want to make sure folks know that how to reach this incredible, impactful, and important blog that you have written, Alex, because it is just phenomenal and adds so much value to folks all the time. <laughs> yes, no false says we need a Tinder for founders and investors. Apps. <laughs> swipe left, swipe right. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, Alex, you know, I, I'd also like to go in and, and start chatting a little bit um, about a topic that oh, we have a LinkedIn user with a question. So I'm going to grab that first. Thank you, LinkedIn users. Sometimes they don't let me know who it is. So pop your name into the comments as well. What questions founders need to avoid during the first meeting? I mean, I don't really think there's there, there are like wrong questions, but you know, you need to read the room or you need to read the Zoom and don't overdo it. You know, you have to, 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 to really connect. You need to be very attuned. Sometimes founders are just pitching without thinking and understanding that the entity on the other end is already checked out. The art of sale is the art of inspiring and engaging, and it's an art of empathy. That's what a lot of founders don't get. Like, you need to think about what matters to this person on the other end. They're not just a wallet, but most successful founders, they don't just pitch. They engage and they they watch, and they know how to how to how to make sure that 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 investors are tuned into what they're saying. That's brilliant advice. I love it. And great question. Thank you so much. Um, And yes, Ethan, absolutely. Empathy is key. Oh, I love that. All right. So as you know, this show amplifies diverse founders, okay, and diverse investors. And so, you know, and, and you had a great post on LinkedIn talking about the recent numbers, right? Um, about the deep disparity between white male founders access to capital versus female and BIPOC founders access to capital. And I know, and you can share your funds portfolio mix, which is delicious and wonderful and clearly diverse, but I'd love to hear your insights on how so many of the founders that are on the show and watching the show how they you know can get through this implicit bias against female founders and BIPOC founders when they're raising capital. And in your humble opinion, what needs to happen to change these abysmal and frustrating numbers? I think truly a challenging topic, and my answer may be a surprising answer. I think that biases are simply a relic of an old world, which is why it's been so difficult for us to dispatch of them. When I look at my daughters who are, um, you know, freshmen in college and one of them is a sophomore in high school, I don't think they see genders, colors, races. They're just children of the internet. And that is that generation. They understand that everybody is a person and, and we're all equal. And we're not, they're not judging. When you think about these biases, it's relics of the past. The reason that it's been so difficult is because you cannot, uh, you know, if somebody has these biases, you telling them, hey, don't be biased against women. I just don't think they're listening. And so when you ask, what is our secret for why do we have, you know, over 40% of the portfolio has a female founder? We're not choosing them. 
because they're women. We're choosing them because they're excellent entrepreneurs. We don't look at gender. We don't look at uh, you know their sexual orientation. Or I funded probably more married couples than uh, anybody else. And well, that that's a real a bias. Massive, <laughs> massive, massive, massive no, no, in venture, right? Because right. they always thought that if you fight at home, you're gonna kaput the business, and it's just silly. We funded twins, we funded brother and sister, uh, whoever you can think. And so the reality is what we don't fund is people who don't have good businesses. And there, there are women who don't have good businesses and there are men who don't have good businesses. And right. we don't fund them. And we're very quick to pass. Now, people may misinterpret it. People may say, oh, you're not investing in me because uh, I'm a woman, and the answer is never. That's simply false. You can look at our track record. We're not investing because we do not believe you have a good business. And so the challenge with the industry, Andy, is that all of this gets mixed into one uh, hodgepodge of emotions and screaming and yelling. And But the reality is I think it will go away. And if the world continues to stay democratic and head in the direction it's heading, right. Uh, but th this is just simply going to be erased and we're going to continue to expand opportunities because uh, I know that my generation of my children is not going to have these biases. Right. And and I had a young, very young millennial Z borderline on the show earlier this week. And she, she was in robotics and all the competitions growing up in middle school and high school and was raised by a feminist and, you know, got a bunch of degrees and soared. She was shocked that this was happening, and she readily admitted that if she had been a white guy, she'd be much further along. <laughs> and so, in raising capital for her tech-based uh, business, but you know, the thing too that I'm going to just share: I was at Harvard's VC and private equity event that the students led from the Harvard Business School, and I saw a very deep commitment to building wealth without impact. And there were a lot of excellent discussions on why they would invest in something. And it was because they wanted to go along with what they knew to be true based on past, based on like an Andreessen Horowitz type of model for investing in companies. And I thought to myself, there's just, that's just going to continue to serve the white male paradigm. And I think that you're correct in, in that it will shift. But is there a way that we could publicly like have a, a a barometer check, some way of tracking, because we get a lot of lip surface, Alex. You walk your talk. You say that you, it's about the founder and the team and the business, and oh, wow, if they happen to be married, twins, uh, family members, or female or, or black, That's we're looking at the business model and you mean it. So many of these funds do not mean it. Any thoughts on that? And we have tracking, like, could, or is that? They're, they're, they're lost. They're lost. Look, bottom line is very simple. Diversity is a good business. Again, some of my best performing companies, a lot of them are led by women. And so, I mean, look, my job is to effectively uh, deliver returns for my LPs. That is my job. And That's right. Uh, my job is not to solve the diversity issue. Just, it's just, it's not. That said, I am solving the diversity issue because I'm doing my job and my job tells me invest in best founders and whoever happens to be the best founder. And for us, it is a lot of female founders, you know? And so for us, diversity, I mean, it's unfathomable to me why anyone would possibly pass on a great founding team because they don't like their gender, sexual orientation, or a, a color. I mean, it is and, just so and dumb. Alex, I, I don't think it's understand it. I don't think it's because they don't like it. It really is a pattern matching situation. And because they're so committed, as they should be, to returning the best investment return for their LPs, they are, they actually are afraid they're, they have these walls up. 
you know, and right. I'm going to bring up a few right. of Ethan's wonderful. They're definitely wrong because future is not like the past. That's one of the things that great investors truly understand. Future yes. is not like the past. See, that's so wise. So I love what Ethan's saying here. So as long as exposure continues, the challenge will get mitigated with time. Best that underrepresented people focus on building quality businesses that focus on real problems yeah. with sizable TAMs. I love that. And um, and then social cognition posits that people are more likely to align with what they're used to. Exposure to people who are different helps to clear up these implicit biases. Yeah. I mean, look, we, we all have kind of like pre we all have wirings in us right like when we meet someone from a different culture it is an effort to to you know to to understand them yeah that said in venture capital this is the job the job is to make an effort to understand and then write a check to make a leap of faith so effectively what i'm saying specifically i can't comment on societal biases at large i'm just observing that in venture capital it is just plain silly to not back the best founders and, and you know and and to literally there's a difference between saying i don't believe in them because they're a woman that's a whole separate bias we we yeah. we have very hard time dealing with but if somebody knows this is a great founder and to not back them because it's a woman it's just stupid it is stupid, and you've, we've watched them all lose a lot of money by backing totally. out on more uh, typical investments that didn't pan out. And Ethan, given that you are an incredible human behavior data scientist, I love your comment, in behavioral sciences, we refer to it as availability biases. So I'm seeing that the more we get women and black founders out there pitching and pitching and pitching and having really good business models, we will continue to dilute this situation. Um, can we talk a little bit about your incredible mission? Folks, this, as an aside, you know, Alex mentioned that he was from Ukraine. And so when the war broke out almost a year ago, February 24th, 2022, uh, he set up this incredible fund called the 1K Project. And today, and this is where you, folks could send $1,000 directly to a family. I want you to be sure to go check it out. It's 1K Project org online and already 11 million in funds committed to help families. Alex, my gosh, you know, talk a little bit about this, please. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Uh, we, you know, my family, uh, you know, we're refugees from Ukraine. We left in 1991. I grew up there during Soviet era and uh, still have distant relatives there and also my high school mates. And, you know, five days into the war, um, I, just like the rest of the world, couldn't fathom the madness and I also realized I knew what's to come. I knew how much devastation there's going to be. And I knew that families and children are going to be hurt. It was, it was obvious that it's going to be incredibly brutal and, and, and cruel. And so we've, we've, you know, uh, with a team of over 50 tech volunteers who I'm so lucky to have access to, uh, through the tech community, yeah. um, you know, we've, we've launched the 1k project and, it's a, it's a very simple mission. We've empowered individuals, families, family offices, entrepreneurs, VCs, large organizations, and, uh, you know, to directly send money to families in Ukraine. And so families apply. We have, we've written a lot of code and ranking to make sure that we can prioritize the families that are, you know, truly in need. And we focus on families with three plus children. So like you said today, uh, we've helped close to 12,000 families and almost 40,000 children. Wow. You must get up every day. It's, and just even as horrific as this war is and continues to really harm your home country. Also, it has to feel good as a person and as a man to know that you've done your best to help protect families. Honestly, I don't, I just feel, I wish this would be over. 
I don't, you know, people send me thank yous and congratulations and I'm not, I'm not making this up, but it, 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 I'm not doing it for any of it. I'm just doing it because I deeply believe that if you are able to imagine something and do something, you should do it because unfortunately not a ton of people are able to pull this kind of thing off simply because having access to both Ukraine and tech community and be able to have the resources that I have, I feel like it, it's a natural and basically like an obligation that I have to do it. So that's why I'm doing it. But I've said this many times publicly, I don't want to do it. I oh, really yeah. don't. It's, this was not your just, intention. It is not my intention. It is not my intention. But I'm so grateful for incredible support. And it truly is a village of people uh, from sponsors to volunteers to our operations team. Uh, to my co-founder, Chrissy, to head of operations, Justine, people just, you know, committed so much of themselves to this, to this cause. And it seems like a simple idea, but there's just so much involved in making it happen. And, okay. and I'm really glad that we're able to do it. Oh, thank goodness for you that you have the talent and the capability to, to change people's lives and keep people safe during this time. And I think that the Ukrainian people are incredible um, representations for how we all need to rise up and be and take action and really be about the freedom to live and prosper and have families without being, you know, annihilated. But anyway, thank you, Alex, for everything you've done with the 1K project, it just means the world to me and for so many people. What final words would you like to share with folks about their VC fundraising opportunities? You know, some another word, a nugget or two, and then how folks can reach out to you. How do you screen founders? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I know that your audience, um, you know, knows that I'm very accessible. I'm on Twitter and you can reach me. But, you know, I, I've written about this. My biggest piece of advice is be really thoughtful and prepared. Do not rush into fundraising. It makes sense to spend 20 minutes at the whiteboard, two days at the whiteboard, instead of just running around through the universe. And the more strategic and thoughtful you are, the faster you're going to raise capital. And then in terms of, um, you know, re reaching out to me, the best way, if you, if you want to pitch me, we have, well, always better if you have a warm connection. This is just the way the world works. That said, you don't need to. If you go to 2048.vc and click on the team, there's a button called Pitch Alex. Super easy. You can pitch me or any other member of our team. It literally takes two minutes to fill out that form and uh, send us send us your pitch. And we are committed to reviewing every single pitch. Um, we're not able to reply and take a meeting with every single founder. I know you understand that, uh, but we are reading every single pitch that hits my queue, I read personally. We don't have assistants, secretaries, we do the work. So uh, yeah, whenever you're ready, feel, feel free to reach out to us, please. Excellent. Oh, Alex, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for joining me for this delicious and very meaningful conversation today. I know you have touched lives right now and for years to come through this conversation. Any last thoughts before I pop you off into the green room and wish you a great day because I know you've got a... a a hard stop any second now. Thank you for having me and thank you for your wonderful energy. We need more people like you in the world. I love, love, love your optimism. <laughs> and we just, you know, we, I think, thank you for empowering us to share the wisdom and connect with founders. Thank you for being the facilitator and sharer. Mm. Thank you so much. And I'm wishing you a delicious day and a wonderful weekend with your beautiful family. Thank you, Alex, for joining us. Woo! <laughs>
Oh my gosh, everyone. I am just over the moon. Well, you can see why I love following Alex everywhere he glows because he's just so remarkable and he adds value and he's generous and he's real and he's doing the work and you know, feel free to follow up with a question, ask him on Twitter. You know, you can pop in the questions there. No fall. You can, you know, pop in your question there. I know he will answer it on Twitter for you. And, um, and thank you at for always your thoughtfulness. I got to come down to New York city and give you a big old honk and hug. I miss you. And so folks, thank you so much for tuning in and grabbing the gems that you needed today. Here's who's joining us. Uh, on Tuesday, February 21st, we're chatting with a favorite from the Boston startup ecosystem, Ian Kane. He's joining us for a delicious conversation. He's the co-founder of Cubic Labs, a startup incubator and innovation hub focused on helping entrepreneurs and innovators to develop world-class companies to serve businesses, governments, and people. I've known him for years. He's so wonderful. You're going to love, love, love meeting him. And how do you know whenever I post a new show, you join the Startup Life Live meetup group. All right, folks, thank you so, so much <laughs> for tuning in. I'm so grateful for your presence. I'm so grateful that you carved out time to up your founder game. And I just want to leave you with just one final thought. Promise me you'll remember always. You're braver than you believe and stronger than you seem. And as we say here in Boston, you're wicked smarter than you think. <laughs> You've got this, everyone. Wishing you a delicious day everywhere you glow. Mwah. Bye. <laughs>